Sojourner Truth, Bruce Coburn. What do they have to do with a TED Talk on public life? One was an American abolitionist of New York Dutch heritage, the other a Canadian singer-songwriter, but they both understood the power of metaphor in making a point. Neighbors, even relatives, are afraid to talk politics today. Uh, they are, um, sadly, often part of the number of relationships, the many relationships that have been sadly damaged when they enter into these fraught conversations. Negative partisanship is characterized by adverse feelings for members of the opposing party. Republicans and Democrats are no longer seen as just partisan opponents, they're outright enemies. Disdain drives our views of the other side and its adherence. adherence. As Harold said earlier this morning, politics has become tribal. The light of good citizenship appears to be falling rather unevenly on our combative and poisonous politics. Now, this isn't a very shocking observation. You're probably wondering, oh, tell me something I don't know. This is a TED Talk. What is surprising is that polarization is a myth. Now, debunking this common or erroneous view is an important first step if we want to consider uh, the possibility of a new role for faith in public life. Failure to address this confusion right, may result in, uh, well, what uh, Lee Atwater, the 1980s infamous political operative, knew all too well, right, was that uh, he could use ruthlessly to his advantage the fact that perception is reality. Over the past generation or longer, Christian conservatives have heeded the call to get more actively engaged. Did their presence in civic life render uh, it any more appealing or attractive? Doesn't seem so. Uh, over a decade ago, uh, groundbreaking research by the Barna Group uh, revealed just the opposite, sadly, right? Uh, painstakingly detailed in the book Unchristian, Christ followers were found to be hypocritical, insensitive, and judgmental to name, but three characteristics in these rather damning survey results. Known more by what they oppose than what they support, acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly seemed far less important than um, being right, securing power, or winning uh, elections. It has led to a mounting image problem for evangelicals. In the current cultural moment, a postmodern dark age, if you will, demands a new light, one that's less glaring, not quite so garish. Unlike more commonly encouraged incandescent expressions of the faith, such as this one, or this, or maybe even this, we need more recessed, uh, or, uh, yeah, recessed subtle acts of service where heavenly citizens honestly live out deeply held convictions. And so how do we best go about maintaining a faithful presence in the current political climate? Is it found in a misplaced and militant form of patriotism? or a retreat into cultural isolation again, or allowing the state to shoulder the church to the cultural sidelines? I don't think so. How about adopting a more enigmatic posture towards public life, of being intentionally covert when it comes to faith? Now, there is a kernel of truth to claims of polarization. It explains the tenacity of the myth. There is a battle to define or redefine America. We're divided, but closely, not deeply, right? Those conducting the culture war are far smaller or fewer in numbers than is commonly thought. Fiorina's thesis, uh, an acclaimed uh, Stanford political scientist, is that we're no more polarized than in the past. The persistence of the myth, though, is, a perpetua is perpetuated by a misperception. The distribution of the relative few in the, in the yellow, 
okay? These folks are polarized, but it distorts the reality of the narrower popular divide captured in the bell curve or normal curve below or beneath it. This is the more accurate uh, representation where most citizens are located in proximity to one another on countless issues, even the most contentious ones, abortion, same-sex marriage. Why then is a sense of discord or deep division so prevalent? Well, at least three reasons help to explain. Now, keep in mind, remember uh, the locations of those, that blue and red, okay? First off, uh, political activists aren't normal people. Outliers left and right, they are the most zealous and passionate members of their respective parties. Secondly, the media aggravates matters. They do so by focusing their attention on the tails of the curve. Remember that red and blue location of the relative few? Uh, they're not as interested in uh, those folks or, uh, that are uh, the majority residing in the un- uh, or the um, uh, sizable middle. Those folks are more boring. They're not going to hold the attention of a distracted public. And so the media has a preoccupation with those who are outlandish. Elected elites, partisan extremists. It's an as unfortunate as it is an understandable dynamic. It makes for breaking news, or, or actually infotainment. Bottom line, news outlets are economic enterprises. It's not just red and blue, it's green. Finally, a third contributor to the myth is a tendency to confuse issue positions with electoral choices. How so? Well, voting is a blunt instrument. Did a supporter of Trump cast a ballot because they wanted uh, more conservative justices on the Supreme Court? Just couldn't stand the Clintons? Or really wanted to stick it to the GOP establishment? Okay. Support for any elected official never aligns perfectly. Voting for a candidate is a singular choice. You shouldn't ever assume uh, agreement on every other issue, of which there are a myriad. These three factors largely explain this myth. And yet, the perception, if not the reality, is exacerbated by the U.S. electoral design. It's unique. States hold primaries or caucuses like Iowa and determine uh, the nominees for Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, we're not going to be first in the nation, uh, at least for the Democrats, any longer. But the general election subsequently follows, and we usually choose uh, between one of the two major party candidates. Now, it's in this second stage of the two-stage process where a clear majority of the public participates, especially compared to the earlier round. Primaries and caucuses are where the most committed partisans Right? Political purists, as opposed to pragmatists, exert their greatest influence. It's outsized. It's disproportionate to their numbers. And this is why the GOP advances more conservative, if not crazy, candidates. And Democrats uh, uh, produce uh, too progressive or woke ones for the voting public. And as such, come November, many citizens are frustrated uh, when they cast a ballot uh, with their choices. And so they opt for the lesser of two evils. To make matters worse, a misperception over polarization in the public is potentially a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the mass middle, the exhausted majority, primarily encounter only those are, who are like-minded citizens, this tends to reinforce, if not push to the fringe, the prior, if not flawed, positions voters hold. The development or trend is a function of a ongoing clustering across or around the nation, right? Voters are uh, of very different political stripes are increasingly segregated geographically. And so it makes sense that many would believe claims of a polarized public if they're surrounded by people just like them. 
just like themselves. Engaging those who uh, view things from a different vantage point will reveal that we're not as far apart as assumed, let alone or ever acknowledged. Mixed company moderates. A closely divided nation is sorting itself out in a way that leaves the U.S. susceptible to polarization and conspiracy. Combined with the reality of an increasingly post-Christian society, not an if, but a when, creates considerable consternation for many citizens. It calls for a change in how we go about engaging democracy. Followers of Jesus, in my humble opinion, need to learn to live like exiles. Besides, America is less likely the new Israel than it is Babylon. How do citizens of heaven seek the common good? Well, to repeat, by maintaining a critical distance from any one party or politician in order to preserve a faithful presence in public life. This seems uh, clearly necessary, but is it sufficient? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the World War II German theologian, hero of the faith, offers a clue. Appalled by the capitulation of so many Christians uh, in his country, he also grew disappointed with the confessing church, which seemed to uh, be primarily concerned with its own self-preservation. It was actually his, his family, nominal believers for the most part, who he found to be living out the gospel, right? In rescuing Jews and trying to valiantly save their homeland. Experience in the resistance, then, for Bonhoeffer, a lived theology amidst the crucible of the Jewish holocaust and uh, the plot to assassinate the Fuhrer led him to speculate in a series of exchanges, written exchanges with his best friend about the future of the church and curiously, a non-religious interpretation of Christianity. His extended kin modeled what he came to call a religionless expression of the faith. These remarkable loved ones, brothers, sisters, including his twin, in-laws, cousins, parents, they were doing what Bonhoeffer thought Jesus called all of his followers to do. The cultural threat is different, of course, in the U.S. than the Weimar Republic, less obvious even if ominous to some. But concealing faith creates fascinating possibilities. This hidden religious life goes in tandem with a public religionlessness of self-interpreting deeds performed unselfconsciously in imitation of Christ, but not in his name. In other words, let your life preach. Talk is cheap. Faith without works is dead. The purpose of hiding faith is not out of shame or embarrassment of one's convictions. It's to rehabilitate the tattered image of the church and its reputation. Adopting such a posture will not sound or sit well with some, but the fact of the matter remains, right? The image of the evangelical subculture uh, it brings to mind more of a political than a theological identity. Employing a secret faith enables followers of Jesus to prepare for the civilization or the kingdom of God, to do on earth as is done in heaven. This admonition finds expression in the wise counsel for so-called exiles to seek the welfare of the pagan place to which they are called or found themselves. God's people are saved for, not from, the world. Engaging democracy requires a this-worldliness through participation in all that public life entails. As Bonhoeffer put it, living unreservedly in life's duties, problems, successes, failures, experiences, and perplexities, taking seriously not our own sufferings, but those of God in the world. The church is only the church when it exists for others. Participation in the culture war often shines a bright light on self-interest, which, of course, confuses and often calls into question and crowds out the claims of seeking and serving the common good. Recommending a non-religious application, if not interpretation of Christianity, serves as a chiaroscuro kind of politics, pursuing justice and shalom, flourishing 
of all of humanity. This form of citizenship stands in sharp relief to a contemporary political style that too often wears its faith on its sleeve and in essence takes the name of God in vain. A softer and more reflective public presence as opposed to such glaring and performative politics is a needed, welcome, and hopeful prospect. A largely concealed faith allows one to go about public life in a quiet, unassuming, and ideally authentic manner. The hiddenness of faith, a secret discipline crying out for exercise, creates space to heed the following advice. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Go to bat for the defenseless. This kind of citizenship, a suitable light in the darkness, should epitomize public life an engaging democracy for all citizens. Thanks.